you start off by telling me your name? Richard Schwartz. And where were you born? Albany, New York. What year? Um, how did you hear about Pearl Harbor? How did I hear about Pearl Harbor? Pearl Harbor. Well, it was noticed on the radio and uh, it was in the papers. We had no television. So, did it take you, was it instantaneous? Did you learn about it very soon after it happened? or? Uh, yes, uh, very, very soon. Okay. Um, how did you become involved in the military? How did I become, well, in my age group, uh, everyone, all males, mm -hmm. my age group, who were physically fit, were destined to be in the mil military in some way. Even in high school, some of them left high school and volunteered. I had a friend who went to Canada and joined the Canadian Air Force. And I had another one who quit before graduation and uh, went into a military band. He was a musician. Oh. And, uh, other others disappeared. Many of them I have already forgotten their faces and names. Because they were drafted? Or? Well, the draft, I can't remember anyone when I was in high school being drafted mm -hmm. because uh, many of the people were not even 18 yet, so some of them hadn't uh, uh, registered for the draft. Right. But I remember when the uh, time was announced for people locally uh, who had reached the age of 18 to show up at the local fire station to sign up for the draft. And I saw all these people that had been in grade school with me and some of them had, uh, were now in private school and we all stood in line and reminisced about days when we had known one another at school as kids and we were all signing up for the draft. And so that was, that wasn't how I, I got in the military. Mm -hmm. Knowing that I would be drafted, uh, I, I graduated in 1940 from high school and went to RPI and knowing I would be drafted or would serve in the military somehow, I heard that there was a, an enlisted reserve corps. Uh, and for me, uh, one part of that was the electronics training group. And that was, at, uh, that was open to electrical engineering students, which I was mm -hmm. when I went to college, or uh, physicists. So I joined the electronic training group, enlisted reserve corps, and uh, I joined in 1942. I was a sophomore at RPI, and uh, we were, the program was that we would be allowed to graduate, and then we would go into active service. And uh, so I went through college in the inactive uh, or reserve state, uh, status of the Army, Army Signal Corps. So, um, ten days after graduation, I was called to active duty. Ten days, not long. Um, I graduated two days before Christmas. Oh, I should also add that because of the war, our four-year program was compressed into three and a half years. So I graduated in December rather than June. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell me about um, once you did were, were called into service, can you tell me like what your life was like and how it changed? After I enlisted? Yes. 
Or after I was called after in? After you were called in, after you graduated? Okay, as I say, 10 days after graduation, I had to report to Fort Dix, which was the induction center mm -hmm. for everyone in the East, actually. And uh, that was an interesting experience because it was totally different kind of life than I had ever been in. Of course, I it was very regimented. Mm -hmm. And I got uh, introduced to KP, <laughs> Kitchen Police. Oh. And what's that? Well, what was that? Yes. Well, in Kitchen Police, why uh, enlisted men had to help the mess sergeant in the kitchen. And yeah. most of what people did were peel potatoes by hand or uh, wash dishes. Uh, so I did my stint on Kitchen Police, and I also wrote, also had the experience of riding a garbage truck. And imagine someone who has grown up in a, a white collar family and who, for the experience of riding a garbage truck, was bringing you down to the level of the common common person. <laughs> and so that was the uh, induction center. And then I was shipped off to Camp Crowder, Missouri, where I had basic training. What was that like? Well, it consisted of a lot of physical uh, work and uh, field marches and uh, uh, rifle range, learning to shoot a rifle and uh, lectures on lots of different things, military discipline and military rules and regulations. And, uh, we had, uh, we got exposed to uh, how to use a grenade and uh, well, we had a obstacle course, everyone in basic training, I guess they still have an obstacle course you have to go through, in which you crawl, creep and crawl through a field while they are shooting live ammunition over your head. I'm not aware that anyone that was, uh, stood up and got shot, but we were threatened that if we stood up by we would be hit by bullets, and uh, the, oh, and also bombs going off around us. And that was to introduce the new soldiers to what a battlefield was like. And how how was? And the then, of course, you had to climb over the things. <laughs> was this uh, like? How did it make you feel? Were you, was it scary? Was it exciting? I was not a very excitable person. I just figured it was something to do, that we had to do. I can't remember being particularly uh, excited about it. In fact, I considered most of my armor experience like that. Now, going through that with other people, you must have made some, some bonds, some friendships. Any well, it friendships? was interesting that as an electrical engineering student at RPI, there were 12 of us, all of who volunteered for this program, and all of us went through basic training together. And we also bonded with other people from other schools who had been in the, the program. And so I met people from uh, what was then called Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn, what was it, Bro Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute. Now it's called uh, uh, Polytechnic University. And so I met some uh, people there. And one of those actually was a friend of mine for many, many years. He's now dead. Um, then we met others from Carnegie Tech. 
which of course now is not no longer Carnegie Tech, but it's uh, what uh, uh, something else, Carnegie uh, Mellon University. Um, so yeah, we met uh, people, and it was an in interesting thing that also in basic training we had other people that weren't in this program and again it was a great uh, eye-opener to meet people from different eras of life that I never would have met otherwise. Mm -hmm. I met uh, very very religious people from southern states and I read uh, met some rednecks from the southern states and uh, and there was a, a giant of a man going through basic training with us from, who was from uh, California. I think he was a I think he was a graduate of Ber uh, California Berkeley. Uh, and some of these you know, were people that you meet and then they drift out of your life, you never see them again. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that was the uh, basic training and then after we finished our training in that, since we were in this program, we had, the Army always puts you somewhere when they are not quite sure when you take the next step. So we were all sent to uh, radio repair school at uh, Camp Crowder. And we spent about 10 weeks there, I think. And uh, of course, for people who had already graduated from electrical engineering at a school that had a lot of laboratory work, radio repair was just child's play to us. So we, we, had, we enjoyed doing it, but there was nothing that we had to learn particularly. It wasn't very challenging. We, we knew everything about the way these things worked. And uh, at the end of the 10 weeks, we were sent to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, where we were to attend officer candidate school to become officers. And that was a very new experience also. Uh, of course, we didn't immediately go into officer candidate school because they had to wait for the proper time for the beginning of the next class. And so they sent us back to uh, radio repair school at Fort Monmouth where we learned about FM, which was brand new. And so we had radio repair FM. And then after that, we entered officer candidate school, which was a different type of training. There was a lot more, there were a lot more lectures on military topics, and I have a list of them someplace in my uh, army records. Some of them I have the foggiest idea that we even studied that. <laughs> but uh, we had a lot of field work and we were also very much indoctrinated with the uh, observing the discipline of the Army. And we, uh, for example, uh, you would make your bed in the morning and you would tighten the sheets and the covers and all so that they're absolutely as tight as this tabletop. And you were supposed to, if someone dropped a quarter on it, why they, they were supposed to bounce. <laughs> well, I wasn't a very good no. uh, bed maker. And incidentally, we, if we didn't, uh, if they had an inspection and you didn't pass exactly, you got a demerit. And supposedly if you got X number of demerits, 
you were out. you were taken out of the program. Well, I managed to get quite a few demerits, <laughs> uh, but I'll continue. Uh, we finally we finally had a um, big field program. We were supposed to go out. We were going to sleep out in the wilds of, the, of southern New Jersey, which were very mosquito-y. And we were supposed to uh, have bat battle-like conditions. Now on the battlefield, as a signal corps, the signal corps frequently goes ahead of the troops to set up communications, or maybe they'll be behind the troops, but at any rate, they set up communications with, with headquarters, and then, of course, the battle may cause them to have to move in a hurry. So to simulate this out in the field, we would set up our, t our pup tents and uh, get all ready to rest, and then someone would come through and say, we're moving, and you had to tear down the pup tent and gather up your stuff, pack the stuff up in a hurry, and move to a new location where they would take you to, and then set up again. Mm -hmm. And before you had a chance to rest, they would come and say, we're moving again. <laughs> <laughs> and so many, uh, all of us, uh, went for well beyond 24 hours without sleep. And uh, first time I had had to endure anything like that, even studying for exams never caused me to stay up. Uh, so anyway, uh, in the middle of the, this program, uh, I don't remember what point, but it was fairly close to the end, there, there was an announcement that the following people would uh, fall out of ranks and go over there someplace. And these people, of which I was one, were told that they were taking out, they were going to be out of OCS. They weren't going to become officers. Mm -hmm. We were never told exactly why. And I suspect that it was a very mixed set of reasons. It wasn't just the merits. I didn't have that many demerits. But uh, someone had decided that I wasn't officer material. And maybe they were right, I don't know. One of those mysteries of life I'll, I'll never know the answer to. But anyway, we were out and so we were, uh, of course, having not had any sleep for about 36 hours at that point. I got back to camp and I found my cot and I went to sleep and slept and slept and slept. Uh, and then, of course, after I woke up, I was fine. And so what do you do now with uh, people who are washed out? Well, you send them back for more training of something. So they sent me to radar repair school at Fort Monmouth. And that was educational because although we had had a lot of theory, so I understood the theory of how things worked, I had never seen a radar uh, set. Yeah, all this stuff was classified information anyway. And it was very interesting that uh, I was with some people that I had already known in basic training, actually. One of the people from Brooklyn Poly uh, worked with me as my partner in uh, radar repair school. And we finished the program together and were qualified as a radar repairman. And supposedly, we were going to be sent someplace that was using this uh, classified uh, technique in the battlefield. So I expected to be sent to Europe or the South Pacific. But at this point, they go over your records and they say, oh, well, it's been a long time since you've had a refresher basic. 
<laughs> so that I was sent back to Camp Crowder, Missouri, to take Refresher Basic. This sort of a comedy, I regard my whole Army career as sort of a comedy. So I was sent to Refresher Basic. Well, by this time, of course, I had been around the Army long enough to know that there are ways to do things and there are ways to, other ways to do things such that it looks as though you did the first thing <laughs> correctly. And could you give me an example of that? Yeah, you learned how to, uh, to uh, get around certain rules uh -huh. and uh, everyone all of this has been learned that. And so if you're supposed to be somewhere, why well, you'll find some way not to be there. I have an example of that. Okay. That going back to my first basic training while we were in radio repair school, we were in a barracks together and of course they would disrupt their radio repair training to have some sort of field exercises and we'd be called out to fall out, out in formation. And uh, so there was something that we were going to do out in the field and uh, most of us went out, but about we were six or eight people in, the, in our barracks who never showed up out there. And they didn't take attendance, so they didn't know they, where they were. But what they had done was there was a false ceiling in the barracks. And they had pushed aside the, the panels and, and managed to climb up there. They also took the mattresses up there from unused beds. And they'd go up there with flashlights and play cards. And so there were about six guys who climbed up there, played cards while we were out doing whatever it was in the field. And then when the field exercise was over, they'd hear, hear us come back and uh, they'd come down. They'd leave the mattresses up there. And the funny thing was that towards the end of our stay, when the mess sergeant was taking an inventory of what was in the barracks, he said, you know, I'm, I'm missing four mattresses and I don't know where they are. And he would look and look and look and he didn't know they were really up in the attic area. And that's one of the things that uh, is coupled with what I said, that you learn uh, the, the things you can get away with. Yeah. And pretty harmless things, but uh, very important. I, I actually ran into this mess, this uh, supply sergeant thing about three or four times. And uh, so anyway, uh, we were sent back, as I say, for refresher basic, and in that we had to go through the obstacle course, and we had to do this, and we had to do that. Had to, uh, again, qualify on the rifle range, and I must say I did better on the second refresher basic than I did initially. And then we were, I got orders to, that I was to re, uh, report to someplace on the west coast, so I think it was San Diego. It, I was going to go to the South Pacific and so my and my friend Jack Rutledge also got orders the same day. But uh, simultaneous with that, uh, I received an announcement that my one of my older sisters had died at home, and so I got a I got a. Uh, a furlough to go home for the funeral. Mm -hmm. It was quite a long furlough. And uh, so I went back to Albany 
and attended the funeral and the burial and um, still had time left over. I took my time. I, I mean, I went back and uh, went back to Camp Crowder uh, at the end of the furlough and reported to the to whoever I had to report to. And of course, by this time, Jack Rutledge, my friend, had departed, and he was in uh, I don't know, Okinawa or someplace. And incidentally, man, this was a guy who had been gone through radio repair, gone through part of OCS, and gone through radar repair. But the war was winding down in the South Pacific, and there wasn't uh, any need for a radar repairmen. So he ended up driving a truck. And this, uh, you know, <laughs> was part of the, what I find rather comic about the military service at that time. Um, so here I was returning to Camp Crowder, expecting that I would now go to San Diego to be sent overseas, but they didn't need any more people overseas. We, I guess we had dropped the atom bomb by that time or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, they, well, well, we'll send them back to school. So they sent me to radio operating school. And radio operating school, the first thing you do is learn how to touch type. And uh, so they would cover the manual typewriter, they cover the keyboard so you can't see the keys, mm -hmm. and you have to learn to type. Uh, you have to learn where the keys are, and you type is until so you get to a certain point, and then you don't have to use a, have the keys covered. And then we listened to code. We had to learn Morse code, and then you listen to the code in earphones, and you type the message. Now the code came out in five letter code groups. Five letters unrelated to each other, so you can't read, read it. It's just you type down the letters, and then you hit the space bar at the end of five letters and type the next five letters. And you do this hour after hour after hour. And you progress from one level to the next level. And someone comes around and looks to see what you're doing, looks at the sheets of paper and, and grades them. Well, of course, the interesting thing that by this time in my life, at one of my furloughs, I managed to get married. So my wife was on the East Coast, she had a job, mm -hmm. and I was at Camp Carter, Missouri, but I wrote her a letter every day. I'm a great letter writer even yet today. And uh, how do you write a letter when you're supposed to be taking code? Well, I would write a letter in plain English, but just separate it into groups of five letters. <laughs> it was terrible to read, but it was a... Uh, Better. And of course, the guy who was wandering up and down the aisles would see that he, I was typing some kind of uh, code groups and he, or letter groups, and he didn't know uh, what he was supposed to be looking at. So uh, I would secrete these and put them in my pocket and then go back to doing what I was supposed to be doing. And every day I sent her a letter typed in five letter word group. Uh, letter groups. And uh, so that was one of the amusing things had of my you, life. Had and you met your wife before what? you had you met your wife before you entered the service? I met her at RPI actually. RPI? Because while I was at RPI, uh, the aircraft industry, of course, were making planes like mad. Mm -hmm. But the men who worked uh, in the industry were being drafted, and they were mostly men. 
And so they decided they would train a bunch of women uh, with technical training to replace the men. So the Curtis Wright Co Corporation um, sent a hundred women to the RPI campus to go through a special program. It was a one-year program for them. And they didn't get a group degree, they got a certificate of some kind. And the Curtis Wright Company was very specific about what was in that. It included a lot of engineering drawing, and it had some other things in it. Anyway, of these hundred women going to a campus that was all male at the time, Naturally, this was a great attraction to the males who hadn't been drafted. <laughs> uh, so I met her there, and uh, we had gone on a, a group date of some kind. Actually, she wasn't my specific date, but she was uh, someone else. And I remember her saying at the time, if you ever get to northern New Jersey, give me a call. Well, it turns out that she lived in Maplewood, New Jersey. I was at Fort Monmouth, and all of my radar uh, training weekends, I would go from Fort Monmouth to Maplewood, New Jersey, and we would have a, a, you know, a time together. So eventually, I proposed to her and she accepted and we got married and I, that was in 1945. Uh, it was after I got, got out of OCS. It was October 1945 when we got married. And so anyway, I would write these letters to her and uh, of course eventually one day the officer in charge called me to his office and he said, Corporal Schwartz, he said, uh, I haven't noticed that you've progressed very much in the last uh, several weeks on, on your code uh, work. I said, well, that was because, that's because I never was supposed to be here this long. What do you mean, he said. I said, my original Orders read, training until transfer. Oh, he said. So he looked at my order and said, you're right. He said, well, I think probably there's some place where we could use you. And so he sent me over to what was uh, the sergeant major, which is the highest enlisted uh, personnel uh, in the Army, and it's a Master Sergeant, but the Sergeant Major means they have a little extra rank. And he was the Chief Enlisted Officer for the Battalion. And <clears throat> so I went to talk to him, and he said, well, he said, uh, you've been typing in code school there. He said, uh, let me see you, here's a letter. Let's see you type a copy of the letter. So there's the letter, not in code groups. But, and so I sit there and I type the copy and, and, and the copy. Of course, there were a couple of typo mistakes, but most of it was correct. So he said, well, we need a company clerk in such and such a place. And he said, uh, I'm going to send you over there. So I became a company clerk, not having ever had any training for what a company clerk did. But I learned it on the job. And the company clerk was actually uh, the person who did all sorts of payroll and uh, attendance records and sick records for all the people in a company. The company was what, uh, I don't know, I guess it was about uh, 50 people, maybe more than that, I don't know, it varied. 
somewhat in, in at Camp Crowder. So I became a company clerk, and that was uh, a new experience also. And uh, I do these things day after day. Most of, much of the day, I didn't have much to do at all. But an interesting, another interesting uh, thing about this was that uh, each morning you had to prepare what was called the morning report. And the morning report was a record of who showed up for Reveille and who didn't show up for Reveille. Because it was required that everyone show up for Reveille, stand at attention, and uh, then they call off the names and you're supposed to hear. <laughs> so, uh, The morning report had to be done every morning and signed by the company commander, who was a, a in this case, a captain, Captain Bleefen, I think it was. And so he, but he liked to go to the officers' club and get a cup of coffee in the morning. So there was one morning that he was ready to go to the. Uh, Officers Club, and I didn't have the morning report ready to be signed. He said, well, when you finish it, just sign my name. <laughs> so <laughs> I looked at yesterday's morning report and looked at his signature, and then I looked at I took my sheet of paper and <laughs> I finally got to the point where I could write uh, a signature that looked like his. So morning after morning, that took place. <laughs> and uh, so I became uh, an unofficial <laughs> uh, forger. <laughs> and uh, the interesting thing about being company clerk was that, that we were in the wind-up of the war. The war in Europe was not over, but the war in Japan uh, in the Far East was. And so they were discharging people. And sometimes people would apply for discharge even though they hadn't been officially noted by anyone in the system that they are due for discharge. And uh, so they'd come to me and ask if I could write them a letter to so-and-so uh, stating their reasons for desiring a discharge. So I became quite adept at writing letters for these people, taking the information they gave me and writing a very coherent letter. I had pretty good command of English. And uh, many people uh, got discharges uh, after my letter went in. And so I it was part of my job, too. Well, eventually, we closed down the whole company because everyone was discharged, and the few who had not were discharged were, were transferred to another company, and then I was on the job there of uh, helping people in the same way. And but finally, I was in a company where the first sergeant, was, uh, who is the person that the company clerk really reports to, well, even in the previous company, the first sergeant was missing. Uh, as he had been discharged, <laughs> and they had no one to replace him. So for a period of time, approximately four weeks, I think, I was not only company clerk, but I was acting first sergeant. So uh, that was uh, an interesting experience too. I tried to get a promotion out of it, but they didn't want to promote me. They weren't quite content to pay me a corporal's uh, salary, which was at that time $66 a month. Uh, most of which was going back home to my wife. <laughs> I think I saved $10. Oh, 
Okay. So where do I start? Well, um, um, were you any closer to being discharged yourself, or did had you much longer to go in your serving? Well, uh, no, I don't have much longer. Uh, eventually, we reached the point where uh, I received orders to go back to Fort Dix and be discharged, formally discharged. And I came across my actual discharge papers in my records, and uh, I got a list of things that I had done in the Army, uh, so that I had a, a formal record of how I'd spent my time. And I, so I never got overseas, and uh, but I had many friends from high school and some from college who did go overseas, either to Europe or to the South Pacific, and many of them did not come back. So I also, that was also a new experience to me, to actually lose friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've often felt just a slight sense of guilt that I would never got a chance to expose myself to the danger in that way. But. Uh, So what was life like for you after your service? Well, after after the service, actually discharged in May of 1946, and I figured, well, after being in the service and not technical, I'd better go back to school. Now, I had a bachelor's degree. So I applied, I got my college transcript and I applied to MIT. And I was accepted at MIT, but they would not give me any guarantee for any financial help. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course I didn't have any money. I mean, I think I got, uh, what, a hundred dollars. Uh, discharge pay or something like that and I remember borrowing some money from my sister which I paid back in due course. Um, so I also applied to RPI where I'd gotten my bachelor's degree and they had no uh, reservations. They offered me an assistantship uh, for while I studied for the master's degree. So I went back to RPI and got a master's degree in electrical engineering. And I was, uh, for three semesters, I was a teaching assistant and marvelous uh, compensation of $1,200 a semester. But at the end of the uh, the end of the third semester, I had completed all the requirements and uh, had a master's degree, and then I became an instructor. And I got twice the amount. So I got at the end of my second, my fourth semester, which was May uh, 1948. I, oh, I also had, in the meantime also, uh, during the summer, I had done extra work uh, on two different research projects, so I, I got paid separately for that. I remember, I already had a wife, mm -hmm. and she uh, had gotten a job back on the RPI campus, so both of us bringing in some money, but we certainly were not very wealthy. And, uh, okay, then I thought, well, I better get a job that pays for. So I applied various places. I applied at the University of Rochester, because I enjoyed my teaching. And, I applied.
provide it. Uh, half dozen places, one of them being RCA in Cam Camden, New Jersey, which R Camden, New Jersey was at that time the location of the headquarters for RCA. And they had an extensive uh, manufacturing uh, operation there. And so they, I got interviewed and I was offered a job uh, as an engineer, electronic engineer, in what was called the Engineering Products Department Advanced Development Section. And so that sounded interesting, and I worked on, on some things which were viewed as perhaps something they might do 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. Or in one case, it was even shorter than that. But that's a completely different story. Mm -hmm. I worked there for uh, several years. And I did quite well. I proved to myself that I could do engineering. I remember my conversation with the department head at RPI when I told him I was leaving. He said, why do you want to leave and, and go to work for industry? He said, you could stay here and uh, work for a, a doctorate. And uh, he said, we have lots of faculty openings. We'd give you a, a job of the faculty when you finish. I said, Professor Williams, I've got two degrees in electrical engineer, and I still don't know what engineers really do. So I'm going to work in industry and find out. So I stayed there for about uh, two years, actually. Uh, no, almost three years, two and a half years. And I proved that I could do engineering, and I could. Uh, be creative. I got three patents in, in two and a half years, uh, which was somewhat of a, that's above the average for a new employee. And I was indispensable to the project manager that under whom I worked because he was a, he had been born in Hungary, had escaped Hungary before the Nazis moved in, fled to South America and worked for RCA International in Argentina, and then made his way to the United States. So he was fluent, of course, in Hungarian. He was fluent in Spanish, but he was lousy in English. And so everything he wrote, every report he wrote, he asked me to proofread and correct. So I became also <laughs> unofficially a, an English major. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I would say, well, you don't want to use that word here. But I think I suggest you use this word. And uh, I, I was very valuable to him. So, but uh, in the meantime, I was giving some thought uh, to what my future would be, because I still had a wife, and we wanted a family, and I knew that we couldn't afford a family. So, uh, I thought, well, I really enjoyed teaching. So why don't I look into getting a doctorate? And uh, going into college teaching, my father incidentally had been a college professor. Mm -hmm. And so I crossed the river to Philadelphia and went to the electrical engineering department of, of uh, the University of Pennsylvania and talked to the department head there. And he said, well, I think we could probably give you a position here. He said, I want you to see Professor So-and-so, who is our director of research, and talk to him. So I went to talk to uh, the 
this other guy, and in due course, they offered me a position. They offered me the same salary as I was getting at um, RCA, and I had the title of instructor. So they, in other words, their instructor was more highly paid than RBI had been, but I had two degrees. So I actually was largely doing research, even though my title was instructor. You know, I was on a couple of projects that didn't lead anywhere, but I made a contribution. And uh, in due course, I was, my title was changed. And my pay went up every year. Um, my title was changed to research associate. And uh, we were considered, uh, even though we weren't formally members of the faculty, we were always uh, invited to the faculty me uh, meetings and were recognized to say things if we wanted. And so, from time to time, I would contribute something to the discussion. And in the meantime, I was taking courses towards the doctorate and doing, performing on research projects. I was a, actually about half time f formally. And so that uh, sometimes I had to take evening courses to work them in. But I fulfilled all the requirements. And I eventually, after quite a few years, <laughs> I got my PhD. In the meantime, we had started a family because by that time I had more income. And uh, so we uh, had some kids and eventually I got the doctorate and they offered me a faculty position at Penn. And I stayed there for, let's see, stayed there for about 13 years, something like that, quite a period of time. And left there as an associate professor. I left there to take a job at Michigan Technological University as a full professor and as a department head. So I was a department head for six years. Uh, I finally resigned that job, but stayed on the faculty for another few years. And various other things, of course, happened in my personal life that are not relevant really to this whole thing, but uh, I spent my life uh, as a academic, a major part of my life. And in due course, I should mention that Michigan Technological University in Hope, Michigan is in the real snow belt of the country because they get lake effect uh, snow from Lake Vi from Lake Superior, no matter which way the wind is blowing, because it's on a peninsula. And one side is Lake Superior, the other side is Lake Superior, and north of it is Lake Superior. So you start shoveling snow in November, and you finally shovel your last shovel of snow in March. And so one day, my wife, which was a different wife by this time, said to me, you know, I think we should move back to East where we wouldn't uh, shovel snow so, so much. And so, of course, I was, by this time, uh, I'd been doing quite a, spent quite a few years and I was, at an age when one shouldn't be thinking about changing jobs. And I applied here, I applied there, I applied to the other place, and they were always looking for young faculty members. 
But SUNY Binghamton was just starting an engineering program. I happen to know the dean. Uh, I didn't when I applied. I didn't know that, but I had known him because he had been a department head also of an EE department, and I met him through uh, educational meetings. Um, when you start an engineering program, you don't start with brand new PhDs. You start with senior faculty, so they are looking for senior faculty. And so I had an interview, and they offered me a job as full professor. So I went to Binghamton and spent the last 10 years of my working life uh, on the faculty there. And since there's no retirement age, I came to 65 and I passed it. Uh, I actually worked until I was 73. And then I retired. And then we continued living in Endicott, New York, until we finally decided to move up here to be near some of my wife's family. So overall, how would you say your service in the military affected your life? Well, it goes into uh, well affected by personality. First of all, I I had met people in different uh, so-called classes mm -hmm. in high school because of Albany High School. You know, had poor people and rich people and uh, people who had had uh, family violence in their family. And, uh, no, so I wasn't, uh, but nevertheless the military expanded that exposure to people who were not exactly like I was and made me much more conscious of of uh, discrimination that takes place against anyone who's different. And uh, I ran into and talked to Southerners, for example, and this was long before civil rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, the attitudes towards black people was, oh, of course, uh, President Truman was the one who finally uh, erased the color line in, in the uh, military so that you didn't have separate black troops. Mm -hmm. And when I was in the army, any blacks who were in the army were a separate group, different company. You never, you never had any contact with them at all. Mm -hmm. But some of the southerners in meeting these people when they were walking guard duty, would tell them that they had to get off the sidewalk. And yeah, I was shocked. I never had run into that. So a lot of my attitudes towards other people changed. And it actually was very healthy, actually, to, to get new perspectives, because I never would have gotten it through my family, who had nothing to do with with black people, of course, uh, but any, uh, they were very disdainful of any uh, group that was different from theirs. So, uh, so that was one thing I got out of the army, and I, I can't say that I made any permanent friends, as I say, the one person I did stay in touch with, um, well actually I stayed in touch with several, but and some of them may be still alive. Some of them, when I was at Penn, came to Penn and got a graduate degree there while I was teaching. And but they disappeared, and I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't know where they are now. Um, maybe they're also dead. Uh, so, 
and I think uh, also, having been in the Army, it uh, started my awareness of the uh, politics of the world and the events of the world. I'm very much interested now in world affairs mm -hmm. and what different countries are doing and who is running them and who the scoundrels are, which are plenty. And, uh, and who the good guys are. It made me very, today I'm much more aware politically, even domestically, than I ever was in those years. In my young years, well, of course I, I grew up with Roosevelt being president, and being president and being president, and even when Dewey ran, uh, when uh, Truman ran for his second term, I voted for Thomas Dewey, who was his opponent. And of course, that was one of the big things that Truman won. And but the newspapers all said said that Dewey ran and they won. And uh, well, no. Uh, and this year, when the Republican Party has sent me uh, innumerable, well not innumerable, well, four or five requests for donations, I, my letter to them has been, the last time I voted for a national candidate uh, who was a Republican was when Tom Dewey ran. Of course, the person getting this reply letter in their postage paid envelope. That person is so young that he doesn't know who I'm talking about. <laughs> but I, I have a lot of fun with our uh, answering letters like that, or answering charity letters, which are stupid. If they send a, a post paid envelope, they get the answer. Uh, so, no, I'm, I think my armor experience have shaped what I am, but they aren't the only thing that shaped it because I have many events in my life that have changed me. Now, I'm not the same person that I was when I graduated from high school, and I'm not the same person as I had graduated from college. And so uh, I, I have no complaints about my life. I look back with it on it. I don't brag about it, but I think it's been very satisfactory. I've had my high moments. I've had some low moments, too. I, uh, fortunately, the low moments have not devastated me like they do some people. Okay. Is that it? That sounds good to me. That's all, huh?